We'll begin like we do each Wednesday evening together by closing our eyes. Allowing all the energies of heart, mind, body to settle. Not making any demands of the system. Just an invitation. An invitation to expand our presence. And this isn't something we have to do. It's more of a deep resting and deep listening. Finding some ease. Inviting what's extra to fall away. No need for solving problems or getting anything done. No need to be a better human. Inviting the whole system to just relax, rest. Feel nourished by the silence, by the stilling of the energies. And this isn't some special transcendent state that we're trying to get to. It can really be felt, this settling can be felt right here in the body. As the shoulders release. As the forehead releases its tension. As the jaw starts to feel a little more loose. So as part of our deep listening, we tune into what this is like, how it feels just to settle.
You might notice the belly softening. You might notice that perhaps there is less of a stickiness in the mind. Perhaps thoughts aren't as sticky, aren't as captivating. And even if they are still captivating, maybe we can notice sometimes the thinking mind lets up a bit. There is so much to do, but for now, we're just letting it all fall away. And from this place of ease and softening and releasing, we can start to listen. What is our wise, compassionate heart saying? What needs to be heard? How do we know? Perhaps we hear that this feels good. How do we know? Because there's a pleasant feeling in the face. What's it like to know this? Is there any wanting for this pleasantness to remain? Or is it okay that it's just a passing phenomena? Is there pride because I'm doing it right? or doubt because I don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. 
Your job is to accept each expression of nature as it is. And just continue to invite ease. Invite settling, invite rest. Even with this, even with this, We'll continue in silence together now.
And opening your eyes whenever you're ready. Thanks for your practice, everyone. Feel free to stretch your body if you like. And also, if you'd like to engage in our little ceremony each week, you can turn on your video and look around and show everybody your teeth. <laughs> Smile, hello, hello, hello. Use the chat if you'd like. And friends. Great. I'm curious if anybody, maybe a handful of you, would like to write in the chat how you're doing today, just a word or two, or perhaps a sentence. Good to know what's in the room with us together. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks. We can relate to all of that, all of that humanness that was just expressed. Thank you for being real. And several of you mentioned a little anxious as the election approaches. And just want to name that, um, yeah, we're trying to do some creative things at Common Ground now and pre-election, election, post-election. Election, post and so you might just scroll through the list of program offerings and see if there's anything that resonates with you. Uh, Patrice and I are curating a, a return of the Dharma Among Us on Tuesday nights. And so on Tuesday, the night of the election, we'll hold space for each other and do some connecting exercises, some practice together. If it feels right to drop into that at any time, you're welcome to. And then Mark is, Mark and Wynn are holding space, I believe the day after the election, either the 4th or the 5th, now I can't remember without looking at the calendar. And they'll be doing something creative that will emerge on that day. So if that feels right to you, drop into that. And of course, there's the morning sit, if that helps to ground your day with by sitting silently with each other. It's a great thing to do. You can um, find the Zoom link on the every day on the calendar. And what else? There's a, a group that's forming of nonviolent 
direct action, people who are interested in taking direct action um, and training in nonviolence and providing some stability on the streets and in case there's um, some unrest after the election. So if you'd like to hear more about that, I, you can just send me an email and I could connect you. Um, and next week there's an info session for um, a new program, a collaborative effort with Clouds and Water. And we'll be engaging in a seven month study of my grandmother's hands, an embodied study of my grandmother's hands by Resma Minikam. And so you can drop in um, on Thursday, next Thursday, just to hear about the program and see if that's something you'd like to participate in. You can also sign up and there's a link on our calendar to that too. So it'll be a, <clears throat> a big facilitation team which I'll be participating in, and so will Mark, and so will Io Yutunde, another Common Ground teacher, and Stacy McClinton, who is another Common Ground teacher, and Gabe Keller Flores, and Nils Heyman, Kyoko Katayama, and then Susan Flynn, the guiding teacher at Clouds, and uh, another teacher, his name is Chi at Clouds, and a good friend of mine, and you may have seen him before at the Dharma Among Us, the previous edition, Devin Berry, who lives on the East Coast, will be joining us too. Yeah. So just to give you a, a quick snapshot of maybe some Dharma offerings that could be supportive over the next weeks as we experience, you know, what it's like to be human together and and really try to take care of ourselves and each other at this time, this tumultuous time and not neglecting or missing the moments of joy, you know, too, that are available right here, even in the midst of it all. It feels so unusual to experience moments of joy, but just that simple, you know, spontaneous moment for me when I just felt the presence of other Dharma practitioners, and hopefully you felt that too, but it's such a a, a nice, a nice thing when this heart knows that it can be nimble, it knows how to be nimble, and can experience, you know, the full range of emotions and experiences available to us. So we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks about craving, reading uh, well, let's, let me stop for a second. There were a couple of people who were new to Common Ground in the chat. So just give a little space for um, if you, if this is your first time here to say hello, if you'd like to just unmute yourself and say your name. And if you'd like to say what pronouns you use, you can do that too. Glad you're here. And it's always, you know, a place that we can drop into, even if we don't drop in often. So it's great. It's great that you're here. Some new faces in the room. And good to see your old faces too. So we've been um, using this wonderful book, Listening to the Heart, as a jumping off place. This is a great book. It's called Listening to the Heart, A Contemplative Journey to Engaged Buddhism by Kitty Saro and Tanisra, two wonderful teachers um, in this tradition that we practice in a common ground insight meditation and you don't have to have the book and you don't have to have it's not necessary that you even know where we are in the book but i just mentioned that in case you're interested in the book or what you hear tonight interests you and you'd like to get it you can order it from you can order it online you could ask moon palace a local bookstore in minneapolis to order it from you and probably many other small bookstores would be willing to do that in, in your neck of the woods. So the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about craving. This is one of the central teachings of the Buddha. One of the Four Noble Truths, really central in understanding the, the Four Noble Truths. This understanding that uh, 
that human beings, we experience what we might consider suffering or stress or um, unsatisfactoriness. You know, life experience feels like it's not enough. It doesn't give us what we're seeking. And one of the reasons for that is that that constant craving or wanting it to deliver the goods that it never can, right? And then, and then realizing that with practice, this heart can learn how to set down that trying, trying to get something out of experience. And as that release happens, then we experience some freedom or relief. And that relief can really grow and develop with practice. And the, the Noble Eightfold Path that the Buddha laid out for us is um, a way to experience or taste freedom. So that's a very crude <laughs> and short explanation of the Four Noble Truths. But suffering right at the heart or craving right at the heart, suffering right at the heart too. And so, yeah, I want to continue this exploration tonight a bit. And as I was considering what I might say to fill this out for us, um, just really understanding how, how taking a holistic view can sometimes be really supportive. So there's many ways that we can receive the teachings or understand the teachings many different ways to share and, and uh, feel into the teachings. And sometimes it's good to just, you know, look at words and the roots of these words. Like um, last week and the week before, I think I mentioned that the Pali word, this language that was spoken at the time of the Buddha, um, the, the Pali word is tanha. And sometimes the English translations are different, but in this case, um, and this case, tanha can be translated as thirst. And so tanha is the Pali word for craving. And that word thirst kind of gives us a, a sense of what the Buddha is pointing to here. That biological uh, want, right? Almost feels like a need for something. So sometimes it's useful to talk about etymology of words and in this way and to move through things in a linear way. And sometimes for, at least for my mind, it's nice to kind of take a, a holistic view of the teaching or feel into it as more of a circle rather than a, a linear way through it. So I'm going to take that second approach, this more circular kind of holistic view to, to uh, share a little bit about how I relate to this teaching. Tanisara said, we can't really practice with desire until we become conscious of it. We can't really practice with desire, which is the word that she uses to talk about craving or tanha, until we become conscious of it. So as I was reading this, you know, sometimes it can be such a simple statement that points us in the right direction with practice. We can't really practice with desire until we be conscious of it. So again, so just naming how mindfulness is really important here. That willingness to remember or that interest in remembering to be conscious in our lives, to be aware, to be here, to be present, so all of these ways that we use to describe mindfulness, like feeling into, living into, being aware, being present, feeling into our presence in life, these are ways to describe, and often in a, a more, with some depth or breath, right, what it's like to be mindful. And as I, you know, was practicing with, understanding what it's like to be mindful of craving or to what it's like to live into, to be present with craving, it became really clear how very quickly how thinking is engaged in this process of craving. 
and how it can be so liberating to remember that thinking is just an activity of body and mind that's happening right here. And that we don't have to believe everything we think and we are not our thoughts, right? Thinking is just something that's happening just like, you know, the nose smells and the eyes see and the ears hear. The mind has this activity and it thinks, produces this, these kind of blips of energy. And one of the challenges in practice is to see that thinking is not who we are, right? To not learn, to not um, invest in thoughts as our reality but to see them for truly for what they are as just blips of energy that flow through the mind. They're contradictory. They, you know, often trap us in these belief systems that aren't very useful. You know, they illuminate these patterns that have been here long before, you know, today, you know, these patterns of limiting beliefs, like I'm not good enough or these patterns of blame or, these patterns of rejection or denial, sometimes our, our thoughts illuminate this for us. And I don't know about you, but it can be so easy to get swept away by our thoughts. They're so slippery and so sticky, and they compel us into the storyline so fast that mindful our mindfulness, our, our awareness, the strength of awareness isn't enough to keep up with the pace of the thought, right? to keep up with the strength of the force of the thought. And so the stickiness really uh, captivates us, even with our, when we have good intentions to not be captivated by our thoughts. And these, sometimes these moments of feeling trapped in our thoughts or trapped in our minds, they can be so painful. And really a force to be reckoned with. I can think back to some moments in my life when anxiety, for example, has been strong. And one of the components of anxiety is this mind that ruminates. Maybe you've experienced that too. Or it's just me. (laughs) But the ruminating mind can really have a life of its own. So even with, I remember getting off, coming home from a retreat and, uh, and uh, not long after I had a, an injury uh, from running and it really precipitated this, that injury precipitated this force of anxiety that lasted some time and seemed to just uh, have its own lifespan. So it was almost beyond, it felt like it was beyond any strategy, the strength of any strategy that might, that I might impose to support its weakening, right? So the things that I knew how to do that would support less anxiety didn't work as well. And it was really interesting at that time, how, how strong the force of thinking can be to notice it again and again, it's captivating energy again and again and again. And to learn how to surrender to it. So to learn how to surrender to the force of nature that it is. And because this uh, happened shortly after I got home from a longer retreat, there was the strength of awareness, even though, you know, the mind continued to get swept away by story, by story, by a story that there was a strength of awareness that could kind of feel into what it's like to have this as nature, right? That this experience is happening as the force of nature. And so as we lean into thinking, lean into understanding what it's like, like what the, how the thinking mind is in, involved in this uh, process of craving, this is a, a good example here that there can be ruminating and still some awareness that this is nature, that there's some wisdom here 
that lets us know this is nature and it is being propelled by a force, even though that force doesn't feel um, stoppable, right? Even though that force is going to continue on the way that it will. And these moments in our lives, and this might be one of those for some of us right now, as we are, you know, living the way that we are and dealing with what we're dealing with in the world, with the election coming up and um, coronavirus doing what it's doing. And here we are living in a lot, a lot more isolation than we're used to. And so this might be, you might resonate with this where there are moments when it feels like the system is just anxious and the mind is just stuck in its thinking. And there is this underlying tendency to believe that the only way to solve my predicament of being human at this time is to, is to resolve something intellectually. And it can feel like the whole system, this mind, body, emotional system corroborates in the force and bringing forward the force of this anxiety, for example, or the force of rumination or the force of thought, the compelling nature of thought. But the beauty of practice is that we can learn to not invest in these thoughts And even when they take us for a ride, there can still be a force of goodness or for, and I might call mindfulness, a force of goodness or awareness, a force of goodness, if we can learn to recognize it. And with that recognition that, oh, this is a force of nature that's having its way right now, the mind that thinks like this or that gets swept away in fear or anxiety or whatever the case then there can be a little relief because there's a bit of a bit of relief from that craving that propels all that forward. So the beauty of this practice is that we can learn to not invest in these thoughts, even in subtle ways, these mind creations. And in these moments when there's a lack of investment, when there's a little less investment, a little more space, a little more awareness, then there's some respite there. Even while this heart is churning and it's unpleasant and pleasant emotions, even while the world is unchanged and it's problems, right? There can still be this a little bit of, a little bit of relief. And it's in these moments that we can start to see this whole process of awakening as something that's really mysterious and humbling. Awareness that can meet even that force of craving that propels rumination the force of craving that propels rumination, you know, that is a mystery. And it arises at times that we may or may not expect it. So in this part of how we learn to wake up in a full, in a full way is by leaning into what a mystery it is. And not needing to fix it or even figure out what set this all in motion. But the process of waking up includes surrendering to this. Like this beautiful, this humbling, this uncertain mystery of waking up to the processes of heart, mind, and body that either support us in really beautiful ways or um, challenge us. If we are to, if we try to resolve everything intellectually, it's a very limited aspect of who we are, right? And so during the meditation, I 
it's, I, I tried to point it to us to what it's like to know and how this experience of knowing, of knowing craving and the end of craving, of knowing rumination and that release that's there in moments is requires our entire system. So it's not some transcendent place that we go to or some intellectual understanding, right? It involves the body and our intuition and our emotions. This deep listening that we might do that Tanissa and Kitty Saro talk about again and again, deep listening is about really connecting with full presence to see if we can understand something about what it's like to be human. about what it's like to surrender surrender to the mystery of our humanness. Some of you know that, um, and not everybody, but in May, my mother-in-law passed away and my partner and I were really fortunate enough to be with her for a few weeks or a couple of weeks before she uh, passed away and then for several weeks after and if I, you know, this is, was a real poignant example for me, that if you would have asked me how I was relating to my mother-in-law's dying, intellectually, I might have responded with some very basic things like, oh, I'll miss her, or I'm concerned that my, what it will be like for my partner to miss her, or um, she won't be in any more, the body won't have any more body dukkha, something like this. But that's just, it was so, that's such a limited way of describing the whole experience of being there with her. It was such a beautiful and deep experience beyond words to be present and to bring this full, some full awareness to this experience of dying with another human being in relationship with other human beings and really beyond what words could describe or what the intellectual mind could come up with. Something that felt like, you know, I tried to in moments afterwards, months after, it's like talk about what that was like. And I continued to find it really hard, but I found myself gesturing in ways like, like it was expansive. The experience felt expansive. And sometimes the tears would come as I would feel into what it was like to be there. And to be there with this re- with this letting go that was happening for all of us. This letting go of craving. This letting go of clinging to the body. This letting go of clinging to another human. And watching the system and each other systems go through all the flavors of yes and no that's there. Yes, accepting what's happening. No, not accepting it now. The layers of grief. There was no way ahead of that experience to imagine the depth and the beauty of the mystery of it. So on a real basic level, we live as if our thoughts are some kind of truth. And yet our practice calls us, our deep listening calls us to really see how that's, that's not so true. (laughs) That our thoughts are not the truth. It's not, they're not the whole story. Now our thoughts are not to be demonized. They often point us in the direction or help us see something so we can learn to be aware of thoughts. But we want to see this total experience, use our awareness practice to really feel into presence in a deeper way. And just some examples of, you know, how simple and uh, surface the thoughts can be. You know, they might we might like be able to narrow them down to simple phrases like I'm bad or you're bad or I know something about how we should do this or 
you know something about how we should do it or that's not the right way. And it's such a simplistic, if you think about applying those statements to any human being or any social problem, you can see how very simplistic, utterly simplistic and silly it might be to apply a thought or a series of thoughts to figuring out a way forward. And as I think and think and feel into uh, what we need right now as a as a collective, I I really it really seems like the creativity, the full breadth of creativity, is called for, and that the that our way of connecting and finding our way back to some loving presence with each other, some protective loving presence with each other. You know, that I could add more words to that to fill out. You can see how that, you know, protective and loving are, you know, that's, that's even not enough to describe what we need to come together, to take care of each other, to learn how we belong to each other. But these simplistic views are hardly it. And as we figure out our way forward, we will need to change course, right? We'll need to understand and continue to understand and let things evolve. Realize that life is changing, human human beings are changing in every moment. And in order to know how to move forward, we're gonna have to accept that as as the law, as the law of nature. This is one way to know impermanence. And the only way to feel into some of these deeper truths that we can feel right here in the heart on a you know, at the level of like this system, this individual system, or and that we can also feel on the collective level is by connecting with our moment to moment mindfulness, mindful experience of this, this, you know, simple sound, breath, body. Uh, it's like this. And it's through this connecting, it's through this connecting in a really ordinary way that the system grows in its capacity to be, to have that deeper presence, to feel into the mystery, to feel into the humility that's here as we move forward. I was taking a walk today. It seems like, seems like at least the insights that I can remember, many of them come while walking. It's a really useful mindfulness practice for me and perhaps for many of you too. And just, you know, again, being with life in a very ordinary way, feeling the sun. It was nice and sunny this afternoon and my dog was not being resistant to the walk and I was happy for her happiness. I was happy for my happiness <laughs> to not have to drag her down the street a few steps to get her going. The sun and the wind and just kind of allowing, just inviting the system to rest into the ordinariness of the walk, the steps, the relation relating to my this other being that I'm with and moving and really understanding that this there was a purpose here that that this heart had decided to to land in the present moment you know, that that there was some intention there like and it wasn't that I stopped caring about the problems of the world but it was some wisdom that understood that there's some value in landing and connecting and sustaining that connection in the present moment, right here in this ordinary way. Saida Otejania, one of a teacher, a really important teacher for me, who's has really expanded my understanding of wisdom, of nature, of anatta, this another Pali word that means, you know, not taking things personally. He's helped me grow in, in an understanding. He, and he really emphasizes deepening 
our capacity to be aware of changing objects. And this is useful for us in our daily lives, right? Because our experiences are always shifting. One moment we're seeing something, another moment we're tasting something, another moment we're talking, and then we're listening, and then we're making food, and then we're brushing our teeth, and then we're doing whatever we're doing. So our experiences are always changing. A little bit different than if we were on a retreat and we were doing a lot of uh, some more simple practices and living in more simple ways, right? Just sitting, walking, sitting, walking. Then we, even then our experiences are changing, but our, our lives are, we're living in a more simple way. So I bring um, Sayada Utejaniya just to remember that he, he often says something like, um, it's not it's not a problem to for one pointed awareness, right? It's not a problem to direct the attention to the breath and to uh, to invite the attention to remain on the breath, sustaining itself on the breath, right? It's not a problem to do that, even though he teaches in a way of reminding us that objects are always changing. So it might be breath and then it might be sound and then it might be body and then it might be breath again, but it's not a problem. It's just important to realize that when the mind has this instinct to connect and sustain itself in the present moment, even if it's in this one pointed way, but that there's a purpose, there's a benefit. And for us to be clear about what that is. And so this is, can be useful when we, as we think about how to proceed, like how do we live with the conditions as they are and deepen our understanding of the teachings. Sometimes it might feel useful to do one thing and then sometimes it might feel the right thing to do another. And so as I was taking this walk and really feeling into how ordinary the experience was, I was realizing that the mind wasn't wanting. There wasn't a want for something. You know, not every moment was pleasant, but there wasn't a craving, a sense of like wanting to be better or wanting things not to be this way. And from time to time, the mind would remember that, like, oh, the, you know, we're, we're in a very difficult place here in terms of who, how we are as a collective. And to some extent, it felt okay to allow that to be there. It wasn't like this mind or this being felt like I needed to solve the problem of the world, but it was content to let the world be the way that it is and continue this activity of connecting, of deepening presence. And it also felt like there was, in moments, a real sense of vulnerability. And this is the challenge for us, because it is hard to be vulnerable. And we can know this in a lot of ways. We can know this in relationship to each other when we're disclosing things that feel pretty personal to us. And we can also feel this and you know, like, in ordinary moments, like for me on this walk, when just that letting go releases this feeling of vulnerability, like, oh, I have no control, right? I don't have any control over what's going on in the world. I just have my intentions to be a wise and, as wise and skillful about my participation as I possibly can. And for now, honing this skill of presence feels really useful because I know that deepening my ability to be present, deepening this being's ability to be present is only going to benefit us. This feeling of vulnerability helps me connect to humanity. It's hard. It feels, and I, I could test this out. Like we could all test this out in moments of vulnerability when we understand that life is impermanent in so many ways, this moment is always changing. There's, we are actually in a, in a process that feels like a state and then another state and then another state, but we don't actually see that life is a process. 
awareness is a is a an active, vibrant process. Oh, I lost it. It was so good. It was a good point that I was going to make, and now it's just gone. <laughs> Proving the point that awareness is a process and the conditions fade away and they just fade away. <laughs> Let's see if it returns. Hmm. Recently in a, a, a Dharma talk, one of my teachers, one of many of our teachers, Kamala Masters, was just talking extemporaneously. And she's such a deep, committed practitioner that I can, I really love it when she just starts talking. She gives beautiful Dharma talks and often is very prepared. And sometimes in these really human moments, I just fall in love with her practice. And she said something like, Mindfulness is willing to see itself. Mindfulness is willing to see itself, to know itself. And that really resonated like, oh, awareness, like this capacity of the heart to be aware. And you can explore this on your own. Like, what does that mean? This capacity of the heart to be aware, you know, this ability, like we should know how important it is and feel the strength of the capacity for presence and how that supports life and how that supports our own life, ourselves in relationship with each other and propels a force of goodness into the world that is really needed. Another wise person in my life often reminds me in moments when you know, she's been a really important witness for me and has often reminded me in important moments that when there is a sense of vulnerability there, she often says something like, oh, you, you just got so much bigger. It's this capacity to really see the truth, that clarity that's there, that understands something deeply, you know, is an ex state of expansion for us. And it's in this state of expansion that our energies become creative and we become really useful. We become really useful. It's the limiting of the Buddha. I, I don't actually, this might, this might have been a paraphrase or it could be from the Buddha, could be from the Abhidhamma. Um, but it's something like this. Greed may be understood as a maker of measurement in that it imposes limitation upon the range and depth of the chitta. The chitta is the heart. Greed may be understood as a maker of measurement in that it imposes limitation upon the range and depth of the chitta. And if anybody knows that this, that source, you can post it in the chat because I don't have it. But just how how, you know, that this expansive state, this expanse in our capacity to be useful, to generate good, to support each other, to feel into the goodness of our being, to know love, to know compassion, to know equanimity, to know mindfulness, is really, is really an aspect of practice and a result of our mindfulness, our steady Dharma practice, our steady mindfulness, and that when we rely on the intellect, for example, to resolve our predicament or to find, to try to find something, to try to become or not become, to get or not to get, then it's such a limit of our capacity. Greed may be understood as a maker of measurement, greed, craving an aspect of greed. Greed may be understood as a maker of measurement in that it imposes limitation upon the range and depth of the chitta. So that clenching or that tightening and needing to get something that can often be found in the, in the limitation of this being, right? The, 
limitation of the intellect, for example, and the limitation of craving that is illuminated in the thinking mind often as a, uh, as a real hindrance to the depth and the breadth of our hearts. I'll end with something from a little passage from Tanisara. He says, as mindfulness strengthens, the ability to contemplate desire becomes more continual. That which knows desire is not desire. Consciousness of desire, this is Shelley, consciousness of desire is not the same as desire. That which knows desire is not desire, she says. And she goes on, as is taught by the masters of the forest school, it is important to see the difference between mind and activity of mind. Desire is an activity of mind. Mind itself has a knowing nature. This knowing, which is the opposite of ignorance, is called nija. The innate intelligent of intelligence of awareness. Ajahn Chah taught being the knowing as an immediate way of connecting to our deeper nature. Being the knowing is accessed through contemplation and inner listening. We often miss it because we look too far. Instead, relax into the immediate sense of your innate, aware presence here and now. Pure knowing is completely immune to desire. To be grounded in presence is to move from the ever-turning circumference to the still center. The idea of an aware center is just an analogy, and aware as awareness has no center. It has no location or spatial designation. This really connects back to what our teacher Kamala said too. So thanks everyone for your kind attention tonight. We have just a little bit of time, about five minutes, if there are any questions or reflections. It's nice to hear. Another voice or two before we end. On the 10th, we have a guest teacher who will be teaching on a Tuesday night, and that program will be a bit longer, 7 to 9. Uh, Jason Soul will give, be giving a talk. Jason is a uh, big-hearted human. He is a professor at Hamlin and formerly the president of the NAACP. He is an activist, and um, he's going to be talking about He's going to be talking about whatever he wants to talk about. <laughs> All right, Patrice. So let's um, together um, commit this amazing act of imaginative generosity by sharing the merit. So let's just reflect whatever goodness has come from our being together tonight, whatever benefit, whatever blessings, whatever, whatever has come into our life because of this time we've spent together, we would happily, gladly, joyfully share it with others. We would share it with we do share it with our parents, our teachers, our families, friends, coworkers, members of our community, persons known and unknown. We share it with the four-legged and the two-winged. We share it with persons who are glad and we share it especially with those who are suffering. And we just open our hearts to them. May all beings find their way to a path of ease and of peace and ultimately of liberation. Good night, friends.
Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.